Well, thank you very much. This uh, this is the second in the series of work that we're doing with Fall Arming Worm. The first one we ran about 18 months ago when we started the Fall Engine process for the accreditation program. We thought that there's been quite a lot of um, development gone on since then, and we really needed to provide a bit of an update with regards to what we've learned. Um, and it needs to be a warts and all um, agronomics around what we've learned about Fall Army Worm and also what we've learned about Fall Engine in, in particular. Since we started on this, <clears throat> the Fall Army Worm has now become a global pest. It's ubiquitous around in almost every continent around the world. Um, it's even now present in New Zealand. Although I don't believe it'll probably be a big issue there in New Zealand, it is certainly there. It's on every continent that we've got at the moment. So as a pest, it has now gained a lot of traction. It's primarily a maize pest, uh, particularly sweet corn. The sweeter the crop, the more attractive it seems to be to it. With regards to um, a seasonal update, I might just hand over to Ian, because Ian um, Summerlad, who's our senior agronomist here, has been, th uh, been monitoring this, and he's just got a few points. Ian, I might just hand over to you. Yeah, what we've seen this year has been a little bit unseasonal. Um, well, when I say unseasonal, I'm sort of referring to the um, the trade or, or the programs that we've had in the last couple of years with the way the insects moved. Um, it it obviously manifests itself in the north. Um, it's actually moved south quicker this year, and these are like field observations. Moved south uh, south quicker this year. Um, compared to what it has um, ordinarily. Um, normally we don't see fall armyworm in the south, like around, you know, places like Daniloquin, further into Victoria. Um, we usually don't see that until sort of, you know, late December, maybe early January. Um, this year it was much, much earlier, which is strange given the fact that we've had very mild weather conditions. So, um, yeah, obviously most of the focus has been up north. However, the south has seemed to um, take a bit of a hit earlier than it ordinarily would in previous seasons. I'll throw it back to you, Philip. Thanks, Ian. Um, one of the other aspects which I'd just like to uh, to bring up is the fact that Ag by Tech are, uh, we've got a quite a large operation in Brazil and we've been trying to learn what we can from the people in Brazil with regards to the insect pressure. Now, one of the things is when we have a La Nina year here and it gets quite wet and the southern areas of Brazil actually get quite quite dry. It's the opposite for them. But in the more northern areas, they have um, been uh, struggling with, uh, with mainly in the wetter tropics up there with, with the pest this year. And it seems to be that they are really uh, battling with resistance. They're also battling with their transgenic crops, also not holding the pest as well. Just as a bit of a background, we'll come back to Brazil a bit later on. The... <clears throat> One of the key things with um, uh, with fall armyworm is the complex to do with beneficial insects. And um, we've actually invited uh, Dr. Melina Miles today to come along and say a few words for us uh, with regards to the beneficial complex and what we've learned about the beneficials uh, that are actually working and have started to use uh, fall armyworm as a host. Melina, if we can hand over to you. Sure. Thank you, Philip. So, look, I, I guess what I wanted to do today is is maybe just give some um, some assistance with uh, the things that you might be seeing in the field and that we've been seeing in the field over the last couple of years. And the take home message, I think, with uh, natural enemies and fall armyworm is that there are an, a, there is a large number of natural enemies that we are finding in association with fall armyworm, eggs, larvae, pupae. Many of these we're familiar with from other caterpillar pests, particularly Helicoverpa. But I think from a you know from the point of view that this is a new pest, it really is very exciting to see just how many natural enemies there are in the field uh, to give you some assistance in control. So I'll whip through them. Uh, I've tried to label them as best I can, and hopefully you'll recognise some of the things that you have been seeing. So probably one of the most abundant natural enemies that we have in the field is spiders. They're, they're pretty much underrated. When we do insecticide impact trials, they are always the most numerous natural enemy that we find in the field. And we know from experience with Helicoverpa and now with fall armyworm that there are a number of groups of spiders that are very uh, interested in eggs. And so you can see here um, a spider eating a fall armyworm egg mass. They will attack the larvae, both things like the lynx spiders that hunt them, as well as things that will catch them in their webs. 
When it comes to uh, predators that leave some evidence that they are there, if you've if you've been out looking for fall armyworm, you almost inevitably will have seen larvae like this, sort of of different sizes. This is quite a big one. And people have sent me lots of photos saying, what's happening here? And it, it is essentially what is left after something has eaten it. And for the most part, the most abundant predator that leaves one of these uh, corpses behind is the predatory shield bug. So you can see here, there's a glossy shield bug in there that has been feeding. We also see quite a lot of uh, spine predatory shield bugs as well. And just to give you a little reminder, if you're seeing egg masses with these little eyelashes on them, egg, egg rafts, that's the spiny. Similar egg rafts without the little eyelashes around the edge of the eggs, they are the glossy. And um, so that they're pretty abundant. We see the, them building up in numbers as the season progresses. But there are even more. So the other things that we find quite commonly are minute pirate bug. And we know that they are fairly, um, you know, readily eat eggs and small larvae, anything smaller than them. We see quite a bit of lacewing activity. And then not so often, but, you know, quite uh, impressive are the assassin bugs uh, and lady beetles. And they will feed on both the eggs and small larvae. One of the other things, you know, just to reiterate that, you know, these corpses are very common. One of the other things that you will see in a sprayed situation is larvae that, you, you know, you might wonder, have they been parasitized? Has a parasitoid emerged? That's why they're looking a bit crook. Uh, and in this instance, this is a fairly typical presentation for a larva that has had an exposure to chlorantranilprol or Altacor or Vantacor. So, you know, there, we've got some information on the Beak Sheet website about what do larvae look like when they've had a dose of, of the various insecticides. And we know that that's classic uh, chlorantranilaprol impact, uh, quite a bit different from this sort of corpse appearance. So the things that we're seeing really frequently and that I would expect that you have probably seen too and maybe not, so, you know, not known what it was, you'll often come across these little, uh, probably about uh, five millimeter uh, white pupae stuck to the leaf or stuck in the leaf axils. They are the pupae of Chelonis and Chelonis is, you can see how tiny it is here next to a fall armyworm egg mass. It is a parasitoid that lays its eggs into the fall armyworm eggs, but it doesn't emerge until uh, that egg has developed um, and a larva got to about second or third instar. So that's a really common one in every region that we've surveyed, uh, we've found Cholonus. The other egg parasitoid that uh, we have recorded from fall armyworm, but sadly, you know, we don't see what we see with Helicoverpa in sorghum, for example, where we see the populations building over time. It still hasn't really taken off, although we do see it from time to time. And that's trichogramma. And if you're familiar with trichogramma in, fall, in Helicoverpa, you'll know that, you know, typically the eggs go black and then the wasps emerge, leaving these little exit holes. And it's exactly the same for fall armyworm. One of the other really common parasitoids, you might also be familiar with it from uh, um, the native armyworm in winter cereals is Cotesia, in this case, Cotesia rufacris. Uh, you, you very frequently come across these clusters of little white cocoons, similar to the Chelonis cocoons, except this, uh, this wasp produces multiple offspring at once. Uh, you can see them just sitting there by themselves, the larva's fallen off, uh, or like in a leaf axle where the larva doesn't fall off, still there. And this is the little wasp, a little brown and black wasp, quite small. And I've had these photographs sent by, by agronomists saying, what the hell is happening here? And this is Chelonis, uh, sorry, um, Cotesia uh, larvae emerging from the caterpillar once they're ready to form these little white cocoons. So it starts off with them coming out and then uh, sort of, I guess, a, a little bit more uh, of the larva out there before it starts to, they start to spin the white cocoon. So these are all things that, you know, agronomists and growers are observing fairly frequently in the field. The other thing that we, we know quite well from some of the other caterpillar pests is tachinid flies. Uh, there, there are a number of different species from very small ones to, to quite large ones. What characterises uh, the ones that you can see um, is the eggs being laid, usually just behind the, the head so they can't rub them off. And sometimes we'll see large numbers of those eggs. 
you won't know other than seeing the eggs and perhaps recognising the flies that tachinids are busy because the larva develops inside the fall armyworm larva and doesn't emerge until it pupates. And then you'll find this if you were to dig up pupae in the ground, uh, fall armyworm pupae in the ground, you might find these uh, tachinid pupae beside it. And then the wasp, uh, the, the fly will emerge from, uh, from that pupa and emerge through the, um, the pupal tunnel as well. The other things that we find emerging uh, from pupae, even though they parasitize uh, larvae, are these large parasitoid wasps. So Heteropelma, which is pretty common, uh, Lysopimpla, which is perhaps not quite so common, and then that's, uh, sorry about the crappy photo, um, is uh, Ichneumon, which you would probably see getting around in the crop, sort of focusing on uh, on getting about on the ground because they parasitize the pupae directly, whereas these two parasitize uh, later in star larvae and then emerge um, when it pupates. The other thing that's been really common, I guess, given the wetter seasons, is Metarhizium rilei. It used to be called Nomurea rilei, but got a reclassification. We see infections in small larvae right through to very large larvae. It can present as uh, white, uh, hardly fluffy, white, very fluffy. This is the hyphae growing out of the caterpillar. And eventually you get uh, this green, um, fluffy, sporulation where it's starting to reproduce and the green spores are there uh, and very evident but you don't always see that so it's much more common to see these larvae that are that are white quite stiff often uh, in the leaf axils or in the whorl and then I put these pictures up because we we tend not to see a lot of uh, infected NPV in NPV infected larvae in the field Principally, we think because they die when they're very small, but, you know, very similar to what we would see. Well, I guess similar to some extent to what we would see with virus in that you end up with a sort of gooey sack um, of virus. Uh, but, you know, I, I've seen very few in the field. Um, there has been some observations in trials in, in Bowen of, of reasonably sized larvae dying from forlogen. So it's not impossible that you'll see them in the field, but I guess that hasn't been a very common observation. And uh, I think that that was about all I wanted to say, Philip, just a bit of a heads up on what the most uh, common um, natural enemies that are being seen in the field. Sure. Thanks, Melina. Um, what we might do is if anybody wanted to send some messages through, uh, we'll probably take some questions at the end of it all. Thank you very much, Melina, for bringing that through. I think it's really quite foundational for our knowledge to understand what's out there apart from the insecticides that we're trying to use to control this pest. Whilst we're on the subject of, uh, of, be of beneficial insects, I uh, did a little bit of research the other day and I actually managed to pull out of the Cotton Pest Management Guide some of the selectivity data which has been generated by uh, by the industry around various insecticides. And what I've got on the screen there is obviously of no uh, surprise whatsoever with Dipel or Forlogen virus, MPVs are very, very soft on pretty much physically everything. Also That's further, great. just going on from here, the uh, the selective insecticides which, which are in the market as well, it's interesting to note which of those products actually are fully selective and which, which of them aren't. So, for example, if you're looking at something like Success Neo, you have actually find that it's relatively quite hard on some species and not on others. So if we actually take on from what Melina was saying here with the with the respective species, which uh, she's noted as actually being parasitizing um, uh, the fall armyworm larvae, you've got a bit of a selection here of products which are reasonably selective, but not fully selective. Um, most of them are very, very soft on spiders. But thirdly, the, the, uh, the, the parasitic wasps that we've got out there, uh, something like Spinetoram, Success Neo, is actually quite hard on trichogramma, for example. This is just a note. And this is one of the reasons why that we've been actively advocating that even if you're using, um, uh, even if you've only ever been using insecticides through your booms, through your tanks, we actively advocate the fact that you actually decontaminate between uses to remove any residues, even of the so-called selective products on, as, they, as they're coming through. We think that this is important because it only takes very, very minute traces of insecticides to actually upset some of these beneficial insects. Mm. We're moving, moving on to early crop development. And at this point, um, I'll just ask Ian to take over here to talk about uh, some of the impacts of uh, early stand establishment. Ian, back to you. Thank you. 
So what I'd like to point out here is obviously we've got the behaviour of the, ends of the caterpillar where it um, tends to entrench itself within the plant. Um, if you're looking at corn, um, so this is obviously V4 to V6 height maize, um, all of the potential there within the crop is already established that early. So if you've got caterpillars burrowing in the side or burrowing down into the world, um, there's a chance that you're going to end up with um, yield reduction. So what I've been able to sort of gain a bit of a handle on with regards to people in the field is that they're going, well, you know, it's aesthetic damage. Well, it may be aesthetic damage, but it's also um, potentially um, affecting your your yield response. So, um, so obviously we've got a growing point. We've already got the leaves and all those sorts of things. They're all ready, um, you know, they're already formed and this is early as four leaf. Um, you've got your tassels, you've got your stalk knobs, you've got your cob. So right at the tip of that apex, is where your cob is. It's already there. So, with regards to um, running it early and controlling this pest, from an agronomic perspective, that's sort of what we need to do. Um, can we move on to the next slide, please? Side, please, Phil. So, by going early, we're essentially um, turning off the conveyor belt larvae. So we don't have continual larvae coming through, going in from you know very small to small, medium large snakes, etc. Um, if we go early, we can slow them down. Um, you know, in the north, the temperatures up there, the humidity and all that sort of stuff can really make these guys grow much quicker than what we're used to in the south. Um, so, you know, late planted corn can be an issue up there. Thanks, Ian. So some of the things um, that we've we've been looking at fairly closely have been the difference in behaviour of fall armyworm as compared to Helicoverpa. And there are some pretty significant changes that we've got uh, as to, to what we're used to. And some of this is still a little bit of hypothesising, a little bit of what we've physically learnt in Brazil. There's a difference around the way that they disperse or migrate, their egg laying, which is pretty obvious, the hatchling behaviour, their light sensitivity and pupation. So we'll just drop into a few more of these things of the things that we've physically learnt. One of the things is that uh, the reason why fall armyworm are called fall armyworm is that they breed up in the tropics um, in Central America in the summer, in the spring and in the autumn, they migrate and they migrate as far as north as the Canadian border or as far south as the middle of Argentina. But when you actually talk to the people on the ground in Brazil, they talk about fall armyworm as actually pretty much it's a sedentary pest. It only disperses. It doesn't spread rapidly. It tends to build up slowly, but there is a trigger. And there seems to be a trigger at the end of the season, which could be related to day length. And it could also be related to the lack of plant volatiles in the air, which are indicating that there is actually good crops and that suddenly triggers them to disperse. And that's what that's one of the things that we're a bit curious about. And there's probably a good topic for some research here. Believe We believe that potentially in Australia, that that trigger, that migratory trigger is actually always on. And it's probably because the pest hasn't originated in, in our landscape and the normal things that which it works, which guide it to, with regard to it moves into migratory mode are not. The other thing, and this is one of Melina's mentioned this as, this as well, is that we tend to get a series of low pressure systems come down off the east coast of Australia. And what that tends to do is that tends to blow a lot of the east coast inland downwards. And this is where we get these sudden dispersive events which actually go on down through the areas. So this is quite different compared to say Heligoverpa armidra, who are relatively quite a local pest, or punctidra who breed up out in the deserts and then they stage themselves through and then they might they come through based on those jet streams which are coming through. That's one difference. The second difference here is the egg laying, egg laying behavior. So unlike the Helicoverpa, which will lay its eggs scattered through the crop, fall armyworm obviously lays you lays eggs in clusters. There's also some anecdotal feedback coming that some that there are is some egg laying which is potentially a test laying or something like that, which is actually placing scattered numbers of quite small clusters of eggs. Either they're getting interrupted when they're laying or not. And sometimes they can, these can be con confused for, for other insects. This has got implications for us with regards to scouting because a field can appear quite clean and all of a sudden you can come under an area that's actually quite intensively infested with it. 
One of the other behaviours which, which has come to the fore is actually the hatchling behaviours. So Helicoverpa hatchling, when they hatch, will actually eat their egg and they'll then graze around. And you can actually see these grazing areas here on the leaf blade where they've actually grazed. And this is a great opportunity to get the most susceptible instar life stage of the caterpillar to ingest something. And this is why the transgenic crop, crops so and BT cotton works particularly well, because they actually ingest as a hatchling, some of the first food that they actually ingest goes straight into their gut, which is actually the, uh, which, which, is, which is laden with insecticides. As compared to hatchling fall armyworm. So the hatchling fall armyworm we know are very, very um, cannibalistic. They will hatch off, They'll discover their siblings, some will get eaten, and then they will scatter to the edge of the leaf, spin a thread, hang down on the thread, and then get blown away to a place where they can then get themselves physically entrenched. So as a result, there's very little opportunity from when they hatch to when they actually get entrenched for them to actually ingest anything. They can come into contact with things, synthetic pyrethroids, but they are highly resistant to, the, to any of those sort of contact insecticides. So this is one of the challenges that we have. And in spite of our best efforts of trying to get coverage, these small guys are not necessarily feeding when they're on their way to um, a, a site to protect them from. The other thing that we find is that fall armyworm larvae are incredibly light sensitive. And we know this from when we're actually producing them. The factory that produces them produces about a million and a half caterpillars a day. And when we actually have um, them in the trays and we're producing them, the rooms have to be absolutely pitch black. We had an instance where we had an air conditioner light on one side of a room that was actually causing them to move away from the light. So they are incredibly light sensitive, unlike Helicoverpa. Um, Helicoverpa uh, are commensurate day feeders quite often. They're not overly worried about, about the sunlight. So this is one of the other things is that, the, is that once that larvae has blown off, it then looks at itself get entrenched and it also looks to get away from light, sunlight as quickly as it physically can. There is also some, some work, and this is anecdotal feedback that we've had, is that the time of the day for applications seems to be significant, that the applications which go in in the mornings tend to have quite poor performance and the applications of insecticides late in the afternoon or evenings tend to have better results. Now, at the moment, this is only anecdotal, but it sort of fits in with this sensitivity of the larvae. There's also some night goggle work, that was vision, vision work that was done that's potentially indicating the fact that entrenched larger larvae vacate their feeding sites at night, whether we've actually got confirmation of that or whether it's just an anomaly, we don't know. But we thought we'd actually probably put this all onto, onto the table just as part of it. The next section here is around pupation. And Ian, I might just hand back over to you. One thing that we see with... Um... Well, we know with helicoverpa, obviously they um, they'll over over position or they'll feed. Uh, sorry, they'll um, pupate within the ground. What we're seeing with fall armyworm is they don't. Um, they do they do pupate in the ground. However, they also pupate within cobs, and even in capsicums, they'll pupate within the capsicum. Um, this is something different. So there's no diapause. Um, they are a seasonal pest for the southern states. They'll move, like they'll do their thing in the north and then they'll move um, towards the south um, via, via moth flight. Um, and yeah, they yeah, persist when it's mildly cold. Thanks, Sam. So that's just some of the, bio the biology that we've worked out. The behaviour is different, how we address that. One of the areas we haven't touched on is the behaviour of the adults and the moths themselves. And we're currently doing work at the moment with regards to magnet, trying to come up with a, with a better approach for actually trying to target full armor moon moths. But the behaviour of the adults is actually quite different to Heligoverpa as well. Just wanted to have touch on to what we've learned about forlogen. And the, uh, so, the, so the scientific name for the forlogen um, virus is the Spodoptera frugipurda, the multiple nuclear polyhedrose virus, SFMPV. These are what the these are what those occlusion bodies look like um, under under the microscope. So when we're dealing with forlogen, we're talking about a concentration of about seven and a half billion occlusion bodies per mil. It's quite an astounding, mind blowing number. But the occlusion body itself is the little parcel that actually contains the virus itself. And this is the parcel which protects it in the environment, protects us from sunlight, it protects us from degradation and, and heat degradation. This is what physically survives in the environment. So 
When the, when the larvae ingest the occlusion body, it goes into the mid-gut. Mid-gut's got a high pH of about 10 to 11. It then makes it through the, through the wall of the gut, and I'll come back to that, and then spreads through the insect. It then, as it spreads through the insect, it then causes all the cell walls to fall apart, and it then becomes quite a sloppy, gooey mess. And in that sloppy, gooey mess, that's where the new occlusion bodies are. And that's largely the virus's life cycle, if you can have a virus for for um, uh, the viruses that aren't actually alive. So when you're comparing for armyworm virus, forogen, compared to Helicoverpa virus or virus, one of the things is that the Helicoverpa virus, the HER virus, is like the gold standard when it comes to these biological products. It relatively, it's quite robust. It survives in the environment quite well. It's extremely infectious. And it, it also, it also has epizootic effects where it actually rolls on. What we've discovered with regards to forlogen and these viruses is that the, there's an ecology that occurs within the insect. And I'll just go down a little bit of a rabbit hole at the moment, because I think it's important to understand that the virus itself is not like a chemical that works. It works in concert with the, with the, with the insect's physiology and also the soup, which is in the gut contents. This is what a, sec a cross section of a caterpillar gut looks like. If you, were to, if you were to cut through it. The inside bit there, the LU is the lumen. And if we take a section of the, uh, the cell wall and have a bit of a closer look of it, that's what it physically looks like. So sitting around this, around the gut wall is a mucal membrane that actually protects the contents of the gut coming into contact with the caterpillar. That mucal membrane has always been, re been replenished, it's getting damaged and it's getting slowed off. And the epithelial cells on the inside of the gut are also being shed into the gut content and then passed down the gut content, then, then out the rectum on the way through. So what's required here is that when those occlusion bodies are in the gut, first of all, they've got to dissolve and break and then release the virus into the gut. And then the virus itself has then got to come into contact with the cell wall. But if you remember that mucal membrane is protecting it. The outside coating on that occlusion body as an enzyme which can partially break down that mucal membrane, but it's also relying on the damage which is done as the gut contents are passing through the stomach content to actually damage and slightly mark those walls and allow the virus to come into contact with those epithelial cells where it then penetrates through the, through the wall and then into the caterpillar. So the reason why I've gone into this level of detail is that the, the ability for the insect to handle pathogens, to be able to handle diseases, is inherently quite high and it relies on the physiology and the biology of the insect to allow that that virus to get across that membrane and actually get out of the gut content into the insect. So one of the things that we've learned is that death is on an S-curve. The reproduction of the virus doesn't go 1 particle 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. There is a certain amount of virus that the insect must ingest and it must get into itself that will overcome its natural defences. And once it overcomes its natural defences, the virus then runs exponentially inside the caterpillar and then the caterpillar expires. So this is what we talk about, that death is on an S-curve. This is the S-curve that we would typically, and this is a stylized, there's no actual data for this. This is a stylized death curve for, for virus or helicoverpa virus. So you can see 90%, you can actually see the uptake. It doesn't take much in the way of ingested OBs for it to run right. Compared to, and this is again, this is a stylized figure, but this is what we seem to feel as the situation with forlogen. It takes more of the virus to get inside the insect for it to get to the point where the insect's natural immunity can be overcome and that it can run, run rampant. And then you're getting a, a lower, lower effect on it. So these are some of the things that we, just, we, just, we would share with everybody saying, we, we recognize that forlogen is an inferior virus compared to say, compared, compared to the virus, but we're trying to give you as much information to understand that if the insect is stressed, that it's going to struggle for the virus to uptake. We are continue looking for new uh, isolates and strains, but you only ever get incremental changes and in increases in, in infectivity. So moving through to some of the work, and this is the work that uh, QDAF did, and Melina, thank you very much for sharing this with us. This is what we shared before, but largely it is still, it, it still holds. So this is the mortality by instar. So the top two lines you can see here are first and second instar larvae, with quite a high level of mortality. But when you start to get to third instar and then fourth or fifth instar larvae, you find that that mortality drops off quite steeply. Now, this is very different compared to the helicoverpa virus or virus. This is why we're only saying, ever saying 
that on the on the formula and label, the recommendation is always only for first and second instar larvae, not third instar larvae, as is the case with virus, where we're recommending up to third instar there. Now, we all know if you've ever used virus and sorghum, you will find dead pythons lying on top of the sorghum plant. And it's one of those exquisite pleasures of an agronomist to go and find those big pythons. They are the ones which are doing the reinfecting in the crop further down the line. So hence, there's, hence this is information we need to keep on reinforcing. There's also full army worm life cycle is shorter. So they tend to move more quickly through the instars as long as the temperature is warm compared to helicoverpa. And this is another important take home there. Now, initially when we did our accreditation work, we settled on the rate of 100 mils per hectare based on the data that we had from what we managed to accumulate from Brazil and our understanding of Brazil. And by the way, Cartagen, which is the, which is the, the trade name of, of forlogen in Brazil, is Ag by Tech's largest product by a long way, given the volume that goes out in Brazil. So the work that we did was based around the fact that we had 100 mils per hectare was a recommendation. The work that QDAF did and Melina and the guys did there showed the fact that there was actually some kind of a dose response. And this is quite different compared to the Australian and the Brazilian uh, populations. The methodology was similar, but it just goes to show that sometimes or you do need to do local work to understand what the situation with it is. I'll just plant two words here, acute and chronic. And this is something which I think relates to the use patterns of how do we need to physically get it. That if we're treating all armyworm with foliagen on an acute basis, a la we've got a problem, we need to deal with it, as compared to we need to keep the crop a very unhealthy, unhappy place. I think that's probably a better fit for it. The next slide here is then talking about temperature. So if you remember, fall armyworm are a tropical pest. They've evolved in the tropics where the diurnal range is quite narrow and it is quite warm. But when you put that pest into cooler conditions, you'll see that whilst at, at 30 and 35 degrees and 200, at, 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 uh, even down to 25 degrees, the mortality tends to happen very, very quickly. But as soon as it starts to drop down to 20, down to 20 or 15 degrees, that mortality, it can take three weeks to kill a larvae, even if it's fully infected. And that's because the larvae are not happy operating in cooler conditions. And this, again, is quite different to the Helicoverpa virus and Helicoverpa because they tend to thrive in cooler conditions. We also picked up this year, and we picked anecdotally again, and I'm sorry, Melina, about using, using anecdotes, that this year particularly the life cycle seemed to be quite quick. And whether that was actually new flights of moths coming in or whatever it really was, but it was just something that was out there. So there is some constants and there are some big variables and perhaps the life cycle could be one depending on the season. Um, using caterpillars as biofactories, as we call this epizootic effect. And this is what we see very commonly when you use virus in sorghum. You find the fact that the bigger caterpillars are scattered, they die, they become the biofactories. Other caterpillars eat them, flies land on them, other beneficial insects pick them up, cart them around, rain splashes around. And part of the reasons for this, as we understand, is that if, if you look at the size of the actual weight of larvae, so across the bottom here are the size of the larvae, and the weight of the larvae goes up the side up here. If you're talking second, if you're talking third or fourth instar larvae, are significantly bigger compared to when you're dealing with the full armyworm virus, which is only working on that first and second instar, the actual amount of biomass that is produced by the dead caterpillar is absolutely negligible. We know this has to occur because this is the life cycle of the life, life cycle of the virus in the environment. It has to be going through this process. But as Melina points out, it is really, really hard and very uncommon to find terribly many dead larvae from putting this out because they tend to expire when they're very small, they shrivel up, dry and blow away. This has effects because we don't get that epizootic rolling, rolling effect. I'd just like to switch back to Brazil and what's been going on in Brazil with regards to the use of it. So in Brazil, as I mentioned before, Forlogen is actually sold in Brazil as a brand name Cartagen. If you're ever doing a hunt through the, the web and your Portuguese is good. And I put IPM up there and I mentioned this last time that IPM in Brazil is quite widely used and it stands for immense pesticide misuse. And it's because they tend to be using lots and lots and lots of mixes and what goes out. The strategy, and um, I, I didn't, I didn't translate, didn't translate the text on here from uh, from one of the up, one of the um, the promotional brochures we're using in in Brazil. The approach that they tend to be using is that they're using multiple low rate doses mixed with insecticides through that early stage of the crop through V4, V8, V, and and up up to the point where we're getting closer to tasseling. That's where they're physically using. And what they're saying here 
on this next slide here is when they're using it with mixes, is that the mix with the foliagen or the mix with the cartogen tends to be extending the performance of the conventional insecticides that they're putting it with. And that's what that graph was. We will make this video available afterwards and the data available as well. But this is giving a bit of a snapshot of some of the things because there's hundreds of thousands of hectares of this used in Brazil. This is some of the outcomes and the, and the work that's been done because it all goes out in blends and all goes out in mixes. I'd just like to touch on Optimal. So Optimal, um, there's been vast volumes of Optimal used this year in Vivus. There's probably two and a half times the volume of Optimal has been going out with Vivus. It was originally, the work was originally done by the Queensland University of Technology, Technology and it was actually looking at fructose sugars and petroleum spray oil. And for whatever reason, that they were actually getting significantly better infectious infections. And this is with, with this is with virus. There are various theories that are out there. Someone said it was a feeding stimulant, and I don't buy a couple of litres of, a couple of hectares of, a couple of litres of molasses, which is the easy source of, of fructose. I just don't buy that over 10,000 square metres. There is also a school of thought to think that the occlusion bodies themselves have a polar charge, as does the fructose sugar, and they tend to bind together, we're guessing, and this could actually be potentially protecting the virus in the environment. So <clears throat> either which way, the data regularly shows the fact that by using Optimal with Vivus, the Helicoverpa virus, you get a better result. Ergo, we're recommending we use it uh, with Forlogen. So it could be protecting the environment, um, or it could also be doing something also inside the insect gut. We don't really know. It's a whole other area of research that's there. Also an Optimal is a crop oil, and it was DC from cotton. And this is purely just giving it the same as a uh, as, as any, any kind of spray oil would really do. It improves your droplet control and improve your droplet placement. So you're getting the adjuvant effect there. If you are water running, um, if you're putting uh, foliage in through overhead, overhead gear, you don't need to do it. Just as a segue then to the application by overhead irrigation, and we did touch on this at the initial um, uh, accreditation we did here. So we did some work with blue dye and a baboon and just to see where it was physically going to end up in the plant, and it's quite obvious that's where it is. What was astounding is when we simulated rainfall through the cob, we actually noticed that the blue dye was absolutely fully cob through the whole plant. So if you run the numbers, and there's a recommendation on the label of a maximum of no more than a 10 millimetre watering, if you take 200 mils of foliagen at 7.5 billion occlusion bodies per mil, that translates to 11 million occlusion bodies per litre which is actually still quite a reasonable number. And what that's physically doing is you're using your pivot or your overhead irrigator as a seriously, seriously big boom spray. And what the water is doing is the water is then running down into the whirl, the leaf blades, every little nook and cranny, and then dries out. And that places the occlusion bodies there. As we mentioned before, with the light sensitivity of the larvae and the behavior of the larvae, this is exactly where they're going. And we know the plant is never going to be more than 23 or 24 degrees Celsius due to the evapotranspiration, which, which, will, which, was, which is quite the Goldilocks zone for the virus to survive in. And typically it's in the darkness as well, because the breakdown of those occlusion bodies tends to be where, where you get the UV light on them. So the dark and cool places. But a technical stuff, it seems to be, and this is the same as virus as it is with foliagen, compatible with most insecticides, pesticides, the critical thing here, if your pH of 7 is lower or lower is ideal, if it's over a pH of 8, use a buffer. Now, what's critical here is that the occlusion bodies, if you remember back, break down in the high gut pH. So the gut pH of about the 10 to 11 is where those occlusion bodies break down. So if you, if you have a high pH water, those occlusion bodies start to break down. And they then release the virus, and the virus thing then is, is too dilute, and then can't come into contact with, uh, with with the gut wall. So that's why we always recommend once you get over a pH of eight, use a buffer to buffer it down. There's been some misinformation out there about the pH and about NPVs, but if you've got an NPV which is bulletproof at a pH of nine, you're going to struggle with it with a breakdown inside the gut. It's as simple as that. A lot of foliar fertilizers, some foliar fertilizers, uh, potassium and uh, um, copper-based insecticides tend to generate a very high pH as they're going through. So with whatever you're doing, even if you are still want to use these ones, always add the foliagen to the tank, the very last thing, and then use it as quickly as possible. Don't leave it sitting overnight. If you're going with a tank mix or if your pH is over pH of seven, make sure you use it up immediately. 
We are also picking up some indications some of the, through some of the lab work we're doing, particularly in Brazil, that there are some positive interactions with prior and post-applied conventional insecticides. It's really quite vague, but there is a suggestion, and at the moment there is no solid data on this, that potentially insecticide-affected larvae are more susceptible to the virus, and conversely, virus-infected larvae are more susceptible to, uh, to insecticides. Again, this is a whole other area which is really, really quite complex and hard to, um, um, to, to unthread. We're coming to the end of it now. Um, I just thought something else that we've done is actually looking at um, an, an efficacy waterfall. And this is telling a bit of a story, and it came to, came to me with a bit of an epiphany a couple of months ago around the difference between a good application job and a poor application job. Um, what I've got here is a, is a waterfall chart. So there are various aspects here. So if we're dealing with the baseline potency of an NPV, if we just pick that as being 100, when we go through and we select out of the thousands of different isolates that we work with, we select the ones which have the higher levels of efficacy, we can actually get an increase over the general wild NPVs to a small degree. So we can actually increase the efficacy above. With them, there's some jiggery pokery that we do with the manufacturing process, and you can potentially add even a little bit more with this. However, when we go from a laboratory formulation to producing millions of caterpillars, there's always some kind of a penalty with the performance. And this is partly to do with some of the things which happen with caterpillars when you mass rear them. So there's always going to be a bit of a loss. Whenever it's stored or transported, sometimes it gets a little bit warm. There could be a small drop in, in performance. When you've got a poor application job, and I see the aircraft here laying a cloud of droplets on top of the plant, which is great for any exposed surface, but any entrenched larvae are, going to, are not going to get it. So there's a pretty significant penalty. There's a pretty significant penalty if you had by having poor droplet size. And if you're laying it on top of the crop as well, you further get another penalty here. So you're not getting at those entrenched larvae. If you're using a pH of eight water, there will be a loss as well. But if you add an adjuvant, you can actually improve. And this is the worst over the, the waterfall effect here. UV light is the worst villain for breaking things down. You can lose some more. Field humidity with a crop like that, you lose a little. Field temperature, it's hot and dry. You're going to have synergistic pathogens out there which are going to assist you with. So you're going to get a bit of a free ride with some of them. The metabolic toxins. And if there's any residues of chemistry which are out there, you're picking up some. But the big one here with any of these things are the number of beneficials which are out in the field. So at the end of the day, you've got control pretty much from when it goes in the tank until such time as it ends up inside a caterpillar. But you have no, you, sorry, you don't have any control over that period as a manufacturer. If we were to turn that application job into a perfect application job, keeping these variables all exactly the same and potentially running it through an overhead ir irrigation, these are variables all exactly the same from above. The droplet size is the same. The location of the plant is ideal. We could have a slightly alkaline water. The adjuvant effect, there is none. The field humidity is good, as is the field temperature. The exact same job, with the only variable being good and crappy, crappy application, is a significant difference at the end of the day. So I just thought I'd like to flag, the, flag this uh, process around the cascade of poor application job. But yes, I put on 300 litres of water to the heck there. Well, that's good and well. What was your coverage actually like? as compared to, look, I only got 150 litres on, but I got fine droplets and I didn't have any drift, et cetera, et cetera. So that's just something we would just like to flag, that the difference between a good application and a poor application can be really quite significant, particularly when the beneficial insects are in the crop and they're doing all the hard work for you. OK, so just, just to wrap up thing here, and this is the warts and all approach that we really like to be quite foundational here, warts and all without the marketing spin. So. What works against foliage as compared to virus? The survival in the environment is not as good as compared to Helicoverpa virus. We know that the lack of feeding on emergence limits the opportunity for the larvae to uptake the virus. We also know that the hatchling behaviour, when they hatch off and run away from each other, they're not hanging around to lay in the sun and have a feed, they're running, to, looking to physically get away from their siblings. We know that they are absolutely absolutely repellent by, by sunlight, particularly larger larvae. The smaller larvae, not quite so, but the larger larvae are very, very sensitive to light. They, they are very, very uh, nocturnal. We know with foliagen, we only pick up first and second instar larvae. 
we know that there's possibly more required to get the same effect. They need to be more ingested. We know that there's no lack of the, there's no episodic effects like you get with virus in sorghum, for example, on, on, Heli on Heligoverpa. And finally, it really requires technical agronomic skills to understand what's going out there rather than I've got a problem, I've got to physically deal with it. So I've really, really painted such a bad picture about, about fortigen, but it is very much what's and all. However, here is the take home for you. There's no known resistance. If you can get that caterpillar first or second instar to ingest that larvae in any reasonable volume, they will die. And thirdly, which is probably a really critical one here, even if it does nothing, it does no harm compared to selective insecticides, which are not quite so selective. There's no work health and safety issue with, with regards to humans. I'm sorry, Arm Ian couldn't sort of help out there. We're not too sure where it, uh, what was actually happening with him, but that sort of uh, ends there. We've got a couple of minutes for uh, for questions, so if you might be able to, I'm sorry to do this, if you could unmute yourself and actually ask a question, um, we'll see what we can do our best to answer. And I think um, I think uh, Melina's still with us as well. Something here from Harry. In addition to the the Portuguese slide, says foliage and plus contact insecticides, which seems to prolong the control of spread off to fruit Japerta, foliage and worked as a residual insecticide. So this is where they're using it with a non-selective insecticide as a mixing partner. As I mentioned before, um, <clears throat> immense IPM stands for immense pesticide misuse. They will put multiple products in a tank and go out and hope, hope that they will actually get a result out there. So they're not relying on beneficial insects. And we know here that beneficial insects probably do as much, if not more work, when it comes to actually controlling the controlling for armworm in the crop as long as you don't upset them. Thank you very much, everybody, for your attendance today. Thank you very much, Melina, for your words and thoughts and your information. We really, really appreciate that. Please feel free to reach out to us if you've got any questions, probably email, um, a text or call, and we'll do our best to answer them. But thank you very much, and we hope this has provided some value. Thank you very much to everybody for the support for the foraging you've been giving, um, and also just the sheer inquisitive nature of everybody to seeing if we can get it to work. Thank you very much.